first started getting involved in separation of church and state, and the first person I talked to said, now, are you guys for or against religion? And I wasn't sure what to say. I mean, well, I, I, mean, I knew the answer, kind of, but I wasn't sure what to say. Uh, we are not for or against religion, thank you. Um, we are a nonpartisan, non-denominational group, and we are also an advocacy group, which means that sometimes, while we're nonpartisan, we may uh, be arguing an opposite side as one of the parties, or non-denominational, we may be taking a different side from one of the denominations. But our criteria is, can we do something for separation of church and state, and if we can, we move forward. That's what an advocacy group does. So uh, we are proud to be part of that. I might point out also that we have 75,000 members nationwide, 8,000 of whom are clergy. So the person who thinks that if you're religious, you're not in favor of separation of church and state is wrong. <clears throat> That's not the case at all. Now, I'm going to quit talking and let you hear the speakers, but I do want to tell you first that we have four speakers, and we will have all four of them speak, and then we will have question and answer time with, at the microphone here so you can ask your questions. They'll still be sitting up here at the table with a microphone, and that's, that's how we'll handle that. So uh, without further ado, I'll uh, have Steve introduce our uh, primary speaker. Thank you, Bruce. I want to say a word about Bruce. He is the president of our organization, and uh, uh, when there is trouble, and there is some time, uh, he's the man on the job. And uh, I wouldn't want Bruce to, uh, if I was over the line with religion, come to visit me. He's very good at it. Uh, so thank you, Bruce, for all that you do. <clears throat> Before I introduce the main speaker tonight, I'm just going to take a couple minutes. I want to say that I look at this as a celebration of the First Amendment, and uh, I'd like thinking about the geniuses who crafted uh, the words of our Constitution and who felt that this idea of keeping religion separate from government was so important they made it the First Amendment, not just the First Amendment, but the first words to the First Amendment. And thinking about that, I did a little research this week uh, because I heard a radio talk show host saying, well, Thomas Jefferson, when he said a wall of separation of church and state, it's just that one letter he wrote to the Danbury Baptist to placate them. He didn't really mean it. There is no other reference to separation of church and state. So I went back and looked at the history of this, and uh, I know Dr. Green knows a lot more than I do, but he may be familiar with this. Uh, James Madison really uh, was the person who wrote a lot of the uh, first verbiage on the First Amendment, and he started out by saying this, this could have been, instead of the establishment clause we have now, which says Congress shall make no law with respect to religion, this is what he wanted to say. The civil rights of none shall be abridged on account of religious belief, nor shall any national religion be established, nor shall the full and equal rights of conscience in any manner or on any pretext be infringed. So once again, just that first line, the civil rights of none shall be abridged on account of religious belief. To me, that says a lot about the wall of separation between church and state. And the speaker I'm going to introduce uh, tonight, Erin Matson, is one of those people that spends her life making sure that the rights of women in particular are not abridged. And we're very grateful for that. Um, Erin is uh, a quite a remarkable person. I've spent a couple hours with her today. Uh, some people are just born to do what they do, and I think she's one of those people. At age 11, she started uh, making phone calls for the Democratic Party. At age 16 to 18, she was organizing students at high school and in college. Uh, at age 23, she became the youngest president of a chapter, state chapter of the National Organization of Women in their history at 23. And now at 32, she is one of the youngest executives ever at the national level. So um, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Aaron Matson.
Thank you so very, very much. It is an honor to be here in Portland today. I have to say, I've had such wonderful interactions with Steve, um, with Americans United, both locally and nationally. Every single uh, interaction I've had has been amazing, so thank you. Um, this really does bring it full circle for me because actually the first major campaign that I worked on as the state president of Minnesota now was on refusal of birth control, uh, specifically in pharmacies, and, um, and we can talk about that later if you have questions, but it was related to uh, corporate pharmacist refusals. Uh, we led a campaign in pickets outside of CVS. Um, I did an, a long series of negotiations with Walgreens, uh, worked on uh, uh, help defeat a negative bill uh, that would have expanded refusal uh, Rights is not a word I like to use in this context. Refusal, uh, the opportunity to refuse for pharmacists. So it's really amazing to be back here today uh, as, as this uh, heats up federally. So let's just get started with some basic concepts. One, there is no freedom of religion when a woman is not free to act according to her own conscience. Two, there is no freedom in the marketplace when an employer or educator is able to select which legal protections against discrimination will apply to a woman, much less when she is nowhere near her workplace or her school. There is no justice when Congress, as they did, awards a panel of five theocratic men and not one woman, much less one medical expert, power to interpret secular public policy that can make or break a woman's health. There is no dignity, no dignity at all, in treating women as legal subjects in this kind of dictatorship of discrimination. And very simply, there is no human right for men to control women, no matter who they are. So how many of you have heard that birth control is under attack? How many of you have heard that a lot of people are saying there's a war on women taking place? How many people agree that there seems to be a war on women taking place? How many people are concerned about what they're seeing, specifically on contraception? Okay, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm going to start out. Today we're going to discuss how the all-male Roman Catholic hierarchy's centuries-old battle for state control over the role of women in society and consensual sexual expression has exploded into a war on contraception and women's rights, particularly young women's rights, in the United States. In waging war on the small d democratic pluralistic governance system outlined by the framers of the Constitution, the all-male hierarchy of the US Conference of Catholic Bishops threatens not only the country, but itself. For it is the principle of a clear separation of church and state that supports the Vatican in keeping its teachings free of the dreaded bureaucratic red pen. It is the principle of a clear wall of separation of church and state that allows lobbyists from the US Conference of Catholic Bishops to roam on Capitol Hill and share their beliefs without having to make the disclosures required of secular nonprofit groups that share their beliefs with the government. It is the principle of a clear wall of separation between church and state that even supports the all-male Roman Catholic hierarchy in explicitly discriminating against women in matters of employment. As an aside, or perhaps even at the core of the issue, Pope Bene Benedict, once referred to as God's Rottweiler, unquote, recently identified the ordination of women priests to be, quote, as grave a moral threat, unquote, to his church as pedophilia. That's true, it's disgusting. 
In the battle over a woman's access to contraception, the all-male hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church is attempting to use its extreme far-right religious fundamentalism to drive public policy and even private business regulation in the United States. Now, let's step back for a moment. They've taken public vows to have no matter of personal expertise in matters of sexuality. They do not have women in the ranks of their leadership. They explicitly exclude them. So because of that, I'm going to discuss, take a break before we get into the current controversy and just discuss some facts about contraception because the messages that they're putting out there are not accurate. And so I want to be sure that we're coming from a medical-based, a fact-based perspective in discussing contraception. So I'm going to talk a little bit about birth control, what it is, and why it matters before we start getting into discussing the health care law and what's happened with contraceptive coverage. So modern contraception is often called birth control. It includes, so we're all on the same page, and the bishops are do, working very hard to try to get us to believe that it's something beyond this. It includes hormonal and barrier methods of preventing pregnancy from occurring as a result of sexual activity. It includes IUDs, it includes the pill, the morning after pill, hormonal shots, implants, patches, condoms, diaphragms, spermicides, and permanent surgeries, such as tubal ligations and vasectomy. Contraception is very important. Contraception or birth control prevents pregnancy. Contraception does not encompass abortifacients or methods to end a pregnancy. Religious fundamentalists have tried their best to redefine emergency contraception as a so-called morning after abortion pill. This dogma is not recognized by all of the available science. And I want you to think about what I'm about to say because over and over and over again, I see the claim that they're putting out there that the HHS regulation covers abortion-inducing drugs, unquote. That is, that is what the contention is. That is simply not accurate. Emergency contraception, this is science, is a concentrated dose of hormonal oral contraceptive that can be taken up to 72 hours following unprotected sexual activity. It prevents implantation, which is the first step of a pregnancy recognized by medicine and science. In other words, emergency contraception prevents pregnancy before it occurs. It will not induce abortion or the ending of a pregnancy. To put this very clearly, emergency contraception is not an abortifacient, and it is not an abortion-inducing drug. And this was verified by the American Medical Association, which actually went off and did a study and, um, in response to pressure from fundamentalists. So that was a finding after some controversy in the past. In conflating, however, it's important that the the bishops are picking on this so much on the HHS regulation and spreading misnomers about emergency contraception because in conflating emergency contraception, which is basically just a higher dose of the plain old pill, with murder, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops is displaying the consistency of its unscientific and unpopular views. They believe, at its core, that whether it's the morning after pill or the pill, preventing a pregnancy or with a condom or an IUD is morally equivalent to walking up to someone on the sidewalk and shooting them. The reasoning behind this anti-contraceptive crusade doesn't just contradict the available medicine and science. It contradicts the behaviors and presumably beliefs of virtually every woman in this country. Between the ages of 15 and 44, I contrast that belief, between the ages of 15 and 44, virtually every woman or 99% of women in this country will use a contraceptive at some point. Beyond, and by contraception, I mean beyond the Catholic-sanctioned sa natural family planning method, which is the one thing that is approved. And one thing that's really important is this figure is virtually unchanged among Catholic women. It's 99% of all women in this country. When you look at just the figures of Catholic women in this country, it's 98% between the ages of 15 and 44. In other words, 
birth control is basic medical care for women. To refuse or block access to basic medical care for women is discrimination against women, number one. And if you believe, as I do, that healthcare is a human right, it is also an infringement of women's human rights. Further, to enforce a minority religious belief is a violation of the separation between church and state. And that is exactly what religious fundamentalists, led by the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, aims to do today. So let's talk directly about the health care law and contraception. On March 23, 2010, President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law. The primary purpose of this law is to expand access to health care, especially for the uninsured and the underinsured, and to put in place consumer protections for the majority of us who participate in the private health insurance market. This law is critical for women because prior to the Affordable Care Act, insurance companies were permitted to, and largely did, charge women more for health insurance on the basis of gender rating. In other words, I pay more than a young man my age because I'm a woman. There's a, simp a more simple word for gender rating. It's called sex discrimination. Also, health insurance companies routinely did not cover women's health care needs, particularly women, women's preventive health care needs, leading women frequently to delay or avoid preventive health care because of its cost. One incredibly common area for discrimination against health care, specifically tar targeted against women, has taken place in private insurance coverage of contraceptives. Many health care plans do not cover contraceptives or charge a higher copay than for other forms of basic medical care. Under the leadership of Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, the Department of Health and Human Services directed the independent, non-governmental, and non-partisan, very important, Institute of Medicine to conduct a scientific review and provide a list of preventative health care recommendations. On July 19, 2011, the Institute of Medicine released those guidelines, which included coverage of FDA-approved methods of contraception. Health and Human Services then went on to follow the Institute of Medicine's independent science-based recommendations, announcing a requirement that health plans cover contraception as basic preventive medicine with no additional cost to be imposed on women. In my personal opinion, as you know, a 32-year-old woman, this is and a feminist <laughs> for you know all of my adult life, activist. This is the greatest advance for women that has taken place in my lifetime. I believe this. The additional discriminatory costs routinely imposed on birth control, as compared to all other forms of basic medical care, are not trivial for women. You know, one of the things about feminism and the whole legacy and history about it is that we talk about what we're facing well, and we expose the truth. You know, when this first started, I started tweeting out pictures of how much I was paying at the pharmacy for contraception. I can tell you that it ranges between $50 and $70, but when I go to get a pill because, you know, my throat's sore, it's $3. So that's it right there. And I work for the National Organization for Women. I mean, it's, you know, so, so this, is, this is what private insurance companies are doing regardless of who the employer is. And so, so much of speaking truth to power is acknowledging that women are paying more and, and naming it. Well, it's no surprise when you think about that. I have a job. I'm, I'm fortunate, especially in this bad economy. But it's no surprise when contraception is so expensive that currently about one in three women using contraception report having at some point not using it as it's prescribed, such as spacing out the pills longer than you're supposed to in order to save money. This is a really big deal. Increased contracep or excuse me, inconsistent contraception use is directly linked to unintended pregnancy, and higher unintended pregnancy rates are directly linked to higher poverty and maternal mortality rates. Modern contraception works. It's great stuff. It's highly effective. Among sexually active women, the 65% who use it consistently and correctly account for just 5% of unintended pregnancies. So this is a huge, leaping public health advance that we're on the brink of. But wait, wait. How can contraception be so good when there's such furor on Capitol Hill right now? What's happening? 
Isn't it a violation of religious freedom and separation between church and state to require institutions to change their teachings to match a law? Wouldn't that be a violation? That's a really good question, and I have an answer to that. There is nothing in the Health and Human Services contraceptive rule that forces a religion to change its teaching. A religion can say whatever it wants about contraceptives, whether or not it's medical, scientific, that's not, that's not affected by the law. Nor does this law force a woman to take a contraceptive contrary to her personal religious beliefs. In fact, you wouldn't think this looking at the news coverage, but even initially exempted were churches, other houses of worship, and religious institutions from covering contraceptive coverage on the basis of religious exemptions. And that was a refusal clause that was baked in the initial uh, recommendations and guidelines. And the National Organization for Women, for the record, opposed that from the beginning because we don't think that anyone should have a refusal clause. Regardless, the fact is religious institutions are exempted. Not exempted from that initial rule were nonprofit institutions with a religious affiliation providing largely secular services to a largely secular public often largely through secular employees, and those nonprofit institutions include universities, colleges, and hospitals. Got it? Clear, clear separation. The policy that affects churches is very different from universities. Now, after much hue and cry led by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Obama administration announced a revised and reasonable compromise for religiously affiliated institutions that made sure that not one penny of those religiously affiliated colleges, universities, and hospitals would be used to help pay for an employee's contraception, while also ensuring at the same time that uniform access to contraception for everyone, uh, so what the... <laughs> I want to talk a little more about this and how this compromise works. Because to hear it, it the way the US Conference of Catholic Bishops are crying foul, you'd really honestly think that bureaucrats are out there right now chasing down monks and forcing them to perform abortions on nuns in the back church parking lot. And that's not what's happening. It couldn't be farther from the case. The compromise put forward by the Obama administration allows religiously affiliated employers and schools to say, we don't want to pay for contraceptive coverage for our employees and students, which I believe was the demand in the first place, right? They were saying we don't want to pay for contraceptive coverage for our employees and students. And what the Obama administration has said is that private health insurance companies serving those institutions that decide to exempt themselves will then be required, the insurance companies will be required to pay the gap on their own. In other words, women receiving health insurance through religiously affiliated employers and schools will get that contraceptive coverage just like everyone else because the private insurance companies will have to step in and cover it for them. Further, religiously affiliated employers in schools are eligible to apply for a one-year transition extension for the implementation of contraceptive coverage in their plans, even if the private insurance company is going to pay for all of it. Okay, so this, this contraceptive coverage actually isn't in effect yet for anyone. It's going to happen in August of uh, this year. But for everyone else, for those objecting institutions, they can apply for an additional year to say, you know what, we have a hardship. We need to figure out a way to implement this. So, um, so on that note, um, really, this is a sort of compromise that I think we can consider reasonable, rational, and respectful, right? Everyone gets their coverage. The institutions that said, hey, we really don't want to, we really don't want to offer this coverage, they don't have to. The private health insurance companies have to step in and offer it for them. And I think it's really interesting. I was actually talking about this um, on To the Contrary a while ago and debating some women from the other side of the political spectrum. Um, I am with a nonpartisan organization, but it's from the other side of the political belief system. And she was, she was, her contention was, you know, well, Erin, why is the Catholic, why is Obama 
trying to pick this fight right now with the Catholic bishops. Why, how could he be so stupid to pick this fight? And you know, the answer to that is actually, why are the Catholic bishops deciding to pick this fight right now, just months before an election? Because in fact, the requirement to cover contraception has actually been in place already in 28 states. And when each of those 28 states made those votes to end the discrimination against women in their health care plans, did we hear this hue and cry? So why not? Why is this fight being picked now? Well, it's simply because this contraceptive coverage rule is not an assault on religious freedom, as is the contention. It wasn't then and they didn't raise concern, and it still isn't now. Fact. One, no employee of a Catholic-affiliated hospital, nor student of a Catholic-affiliated college or university, will be required to be taught about contraception by their employer or school. Fact. No employee of a Catholic-affiliated hospital, nor student of a Catholic-affiliated college or university, will be required to take contraception. Fact, no Catholic-affiliated hospital nor Catholic-affiliated college or university will be required to dispense contraception. Fact, no Catholic-affiliated hospital nor Catholic-affiliated college or university will be required to pay for the contraception used by the employees or students on their health plans. 77% of people in this country believe that private insurance companies should cover no-cost birth control. And the compromise announced by the Obama administration ensures that the roughly 3 million women, many of them secular, who depend on religiously affiliated hospitals, colleges, and universities for health insurance won't be left behind. And they've got the majority of the country on their backs. On average, a woman uses birth control for 30 years of her life at an average cost of $50 per month. That's an average of $18,000 in a lifetime that women have his been historically forced to pay for on top of the health insurance coverage that we already pay for. All because of discriminated, discrimination rooted in middle age dogma about women as vessels, as interpreted and enforced by men-only leadership who won't work with women nor have relationships with women per traditions. The extension of contraceptive coverage to end the discrimination that has been occurring against women in not having basic health insurance needs covered simply because we are women, that is ending August 1st of this year. Or, as I said before, August 1st of the next year for those in the objecting institutions. But wait. This all sounds so reasonable, rational, and respectful. This recognition of modernity has still been rejected by the US Conference of Catholic Bishops. First, they helped to orchestrate a congressional hearing sponsored by Representative Darrell Issa from California, a radical right Republican who doesn't mind getting into bed with religious fundamentalists. Perhaps you saw that infamous picture of five men talking about birth control, the same hearing where Georgetown University law student Sandra Fluck was denied the opportunity to speak. Did you all see that photo? That, this is exactly the hearing I'm talking about. First to speak at that hearing was Archbishop William Lorry of Baltimore. I want you all to remember that name because that is the person who is heading up the anti-contraception efforts for the US Conference of Catholic Bishops. In his remarks, he likened having access to birth control to finding a ham sandwich during the lunch hour. You would never go to a Jewish deli expecting to find pork, he said to a group of men who laughed. This comparison is deeply insulting, one, and it's also inaccurate. To trivialize basic health care in this way is insulting to women. And honestly, when he said that, I remember putting my head in my hands, feeling both despair and rage, and then realizing, you know what? As he says this, and everyone laughs, this is exactly what sexism looks like. To think 
that a group of men talking alone amongst themselves and laughing when there is nothing that affects a woman's life more than a pregnancy. Pregnancy can change a woman's life socially, physically, financially, spiritually. Most women spend the majority of their reproductively capable lives actively wanting not to become pregnant. It's not, you know, on the level of a desire to go to Taco Bell, the ham sandwich shop, or the kosher deli for lunch today. Furthermore, nobody is forcing institutions to dispense birth control, and the healthcare market isn't open. It's not like going out for lunch, gang. Because we don't have a single-payer health insurance system, as nearly every other industrialized country do, we have a peculiar system in which employers pay for that private health insurance. And as we all know in this economy, the decision of where to work is not something that we can just pick and choose off a menu. You can't pick and choose when you're, where you're going to work when not that many jobs are available and there are different benefits and salaries associated with them. Just like you can't just simply pick and choose in this sort of free, cavalier, callous way where you'll go to school when there are different financial aid packages available and aren't as many scholarships everywhere. Look, employers and educators are really good at providing employment and education. Their proper role is not to step between women and their doctors. I just, I don't think I've had a single boss, and I don't think anyone in this room has had a single boss who's better at making healthcare decisions for them than themselves and their doctors and their families. So fast forward to after this infamous hearing. Unfazed by staggering poverty, endless wars around the world, and the politicization of violence against women at home, Cardinal Timothy Dolan came forward publicly and clarified that stopping women in the United States from accessing contraception would be the top priority of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. The top priority. He also made clear that he wasn't just fighting health and human services to ensure that religiously affiliated hospitals, universities, and colleges could make sure the women employed by them could not access no-cost contraception, no matter what even for non-contraception reasons, as in the case of a Georgetown University law student, a lesbian who recently had an ovary removed because she could no longer afford to pay for the more than $100 monthly copay for the birth control pills she was using to treat her polycystic ovarian syndrome. Cardinal Timothy Dolan went on to clarify that he wanted the whole rule overturned because if he was a say, a Taco Bell manager. That's exactly what he said. And he made that specific reference to running a Taco Bell. He said, you know, if I was running a Taco Bell, I would also expect the right to be able to exempt my women employees from this. To say the bishops have gone off the rails is an understatement. In the time period since, they have taken steps to make clear their war against contraception is truly a total war against women. They have launched inquisitions, Galileo style, into the nuns in the Leadership Conference of Women Religious for not criticizing abortions and gays enough. And now they are investigating the Girl Scouts for the same reasons. It may, this is a true story. They make, Girl Scout troops may no longer be able to meet in Catholic schools soon. They're investigating. One almost begins to wonder if the bishops had begun to pass around a well-worn, dog-eared copy of Margaret Atwood's A Handmaid's Tale. Does, do people know that story? Yeah, it's a dystopia where women are imprisoned as slaves, and the state decides what their sexual role is and assigns them colors and imprisons them. Well, I'm sorry to report that this story only gets more ridiculous. And it's more than ridiculous. It's downright dangerous. We'll start with the electoral gambit, then we'll go to their oddly worded summer campaign, and then we'll come crashing down on the most recent news, bishops versus Obama, the lawsuits. First, the bishops have been steering their religiously affiliated institutions to request that additional year I was talking about until providing contraceptive coverage so that it would start in August 2013 instead of August 2012 as for everyone else. 
And they're doing that. My alma mater is Georgetown University. And yes, I did write an open and public letter to the president of Georgetown University when this first uh, broke, asking him to uh, open up the matter to the university, its community itself, rather than listening to the bishops and allowing people to speak. Um, but I, my alma mater, Georgetown University, which is considered to be uh, more moderate in in the spectrum of religiously affiliated universities, it has applied to leave its students out of its plans, which is so curious because they're already offering this coverage to their hospital employees that have been all along. But these encouragements and these applications for the one-year deferrals uh, is really an electoral gambit designed with the bishop's hope that this country might experience a turnover in presidential administrations. Does anyone think they might be working for that against their tax exempt status? Uh, that could revoke contraceptive coverage and probably the whole Affordable Care Act with one swift HHS pen reversal. As a very alarming aside, talking about HHS and the elections, it's frightening to put it mildly that the day that Rick Santorum dropped out of the race. The first article in the New York Times, a trial balloon was floated from someone at the Southern Baptist Convention, a spokesperson, that Rick Santorum would make a great HHS secretary. We all know what his opinions about birth control are, correct? He thinks it's harmful to women, he said. Okay, so after the electoral gambit, let's move on to the summer campaign of the bishops, which they are calling a fortnight for freedom. Yes, they're using medieval language to couch their fight against modernity. So for two weeks in June and July of this year, just four months before that, that election, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops is encouraging dioceses to sign on to its fortnight for freedom. It's going to include masses, education events, and demonstrations against the HHS rule. Archbishop Lori is declaring that these are nonpartisan. The actions will close on the 4th of July with a culminating mass at the Basilica of the National Shrine in Washington, DC. Just in case it's not clear where the bishops think the power should belong on the 4th of July. Finally, last week, 43 Catholic organizations, including 13 dioceses, brought lawsuits against the Treasury, Labor, and Health and Human Services departments in their attempt to overturn the contraceptive coverage rule. We're all watching this closely. Lots at stake here. But one thing that's really notable is who's not participating. 195 dioceses in this country have chosen not to go to court. That includes the diocese in Baltimore, where Archbishop Lori is going to kick off the fortnight for freedom this June. I bring this up because I want to make sure that we make no mistake. We've already talked about the fact that Catholic women overwhelmingly use contraception at the same, virtually the same rates as everyone else. Um, it's also the fact that a majority of Catholic hospital employees support the new rule. Um, the majority of people in this country support the rule. And I'm bringing up the fact that there's so little participation at the top because the fact is, this lawsuit speaks for so few. And already, actually, this is a really interesting one. A bishop out of California has suggested that perhaps this has gone too far. And it's getting too political. And in fact, there was a, the lawyers for the California bishops sent a letter calling the lawsuit ill-advised and imprudent. And at this point, the US conference uh, has not responded to that. So I just bring this up because I want to be clear that we're talking about a very narrow sect of the all-male hierarchy here. We're not talking about the majority of Catholics, and even some of the leadership is starting to um, openly question. So what's next for the activist community and what can we do? Well, this fight is far from over. It's really only picking up in intensity. I imagine that even one month from now, 
it'll be an entirely different ballgame. The first thing that we can do, and I'm hoping everyone in this room who's willing to make this pledge will raise their hand, will be to continue to point out the errors in the bishop's arguments. That institutions don't have consciences. That religious freedom includes a robust freedom from religion. And this lie we've got to keep busting. The HHS rule does not cover abortion-inducing drugs, and I think we should write every single media outlet we see every time we see them reporting that because it's getting a lot of coverage and traction without fact-checking. Uh, go to the HHS website and take a look <laughs> yourself if you want to see. Uh, the second thing that we can do is insist that taxpayer funds no longer go to sectarian institutions that don't want to play by the taxpayer's rules. Faith-based initiatives, and I know this group has been really great on that, and it's an honor to be with you today. I mean, the fact is that faith-based initiatives are not an appropriate way for the government to fund work for the common good. Not when those institutions are not willing to serve the common good. And the third thing that we can do is speak up very loudly and proudly for birth control. The thing is that contraception is incredibly popular. <laughs> not just by its usage statistics, I'm talking about support. From my own experiences in, as an activist, and I have to say, when you're an activist for reproductive rights, people don't like you very much. They say some mean things. You get used to it. But on the issue of working on contraception, I've had such positive, and I've worked on this for years, when working on contraception with my first major campaign that I was talking about before on pharmacist refusal clauses, I mean, I was doing everything. I was out in the street. I was debating legislators on the radio. I was going in and lobbying. I actually testified against that bill. All this stuff. Only one negative comment ever from a member of the community. All support. And so I think that we have to remember that the support is on our side and be very loud and proud about the fact that contraception is a great thing, that the Affordable Care Act is really an incredible advancement for everyone, and especially young women, that we're very happy to see this great advancement of public health. So I think we need to be very vocal and openly ask of our elected officials, knowing this, say to them, do you support a right to privacy with contraception? We should be talking about this. We should ask them directly, do you think a woman's boss should have the right to take away the protections from Griswold v. Connecticut, the 1965 court case that gave that right to privacy? We need to ask these questions publicly, and we need to share the answers we get. And when we don't get a clear answer, we need to share that too. So this is not going to be easy, and I think everyone needs to roll up their boots and get ready. But we can win this struggle, and it's going to be really, really good when we do. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Um, it's really an important issue for the whole country, and, and it affects so many people, for, and we've had this battle for so long. I mean, it's just unbelievable we're having to go through this again. I thought it was done when I was in high school and college. Anyway, um, uh, on the local front, uh, we have people on the front lines dealing with this, the practical aspects, the personal um, uh, uh, trauma to women and, and everything. And so we, we wanted to hear from them as well. So the first one is Michelle Stranger Hunter, and she is the executive of, director of NARAL Pro-Choice Oregon. And I think she can fill us in what's happening here on the front lines. Well, I, 32 was a long time ago. <laughs> Let's just be clear. Um, I have been at this for 42 years, and I wish I could say that what the US Conference of Catholic Bishops is doing today is actually different. Because in my experience, in my life, birth control, the birth control pill, the advent of the birth control pill, got stopped in its tracks because of the US Conference of Catholic Bishops way back in the day, right? Now, 
I'm from Massachusetts. I was embedded, shall we say, in a highly Catholic community. So that even after a Republican-based Congress had passed subsidized family planning services for low-income women, it took another five years before it was allowed to exist in my city. In the meantime, there was just one physician, and if you happened to know who he was, right, you could get birth control. Now, I had the incredible opportunity to introduce birth control to women who had an average of 6.5 children each. Now, you want to talk about transformative, right? We're talking about women who were literally scared of the next pregnancy. How are they going to feed their children? How are they going to clothe their children? Never mind the impact on their body, right? So they were hungry for that ability to access what I consider to be my most fundamental right, which is choice, to choose if or when to become a parent. Now, given my age, I didn't grow up with that right. And maybe that's why I experience it as so amazing. But I can't believe we're here. Can you? I mean, so on the one hand, I'm saying, oh, I'm not that surprised. Because the other piece, and this is one of my favorites, the piece that I remember was when these, this Republican administration was setting up an essential benefit package of services under Medicaid. And at the table was the American Medical Association, the American Congress of OBGYNs, the insurers, the hospitals, and the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, and the National Evangelical Association, and women's reproductive rights at the table, well, for one meeting. We were actually invited off the table because the Conference of Catholic Bishops and the Evangelicals said they would not support pa the passage of Medicaid if birth control was a covered service. With that act, family planning services, women's reproductive health was siloed off to the side. Now, was that separation of church and state? Now, we were given, you know, we were given assurances at the time, no worries, you know, you'll actually be safer over here. They won't be able to get their hands on you. Well, how does that work out? They get their hands on us every election cycle. And speaking of elections, is there any question about how much elections matter? I am honored to be the executive director of NARAL Pro-Choice Oregon. We exist to build a political constituency to protect women's access to the full range of reproductive options that includes bearing healthy children and, of course, safe legal access to abortion. We do that by being very aware of who is running for office. And we go out of our way to identify who is pro-choice. And then we go out of our way to educate the voters in Oregon and mobilize those voters so that they vote pro-choice. NARAL Pro-Choice Oregon was started in 1976. It's one of the oldest NARALs in the country. It is because of that organization, not me, I wasn't there, I was fighting my fight in Massachusetts, but here in Oregon, it is, it is a very special place because that protection started early and has not stopped. This, and I don't know if you saw the, uh, the editorial in the Oregonian a week ago, and then there was another article um, this week, that Oregon is a bastion, an oasis of choice. 
there are very few states left without legal restrictions on access. I really believe that is because of two things. Number one, it is the inbred support of Oregonians, right? Who say, you know what? Uh, it may not be for me. It isn't my choice. It's your choice. That where's the call for the government interference? And we have been very fortunate to be able to carry that message district by district in this state. And it was my pleasure to participate in the 2006 election where we experienced a pro-choice majority in Salem. And because of that, Representative Carolyn Tomei was able to shepherd through after how many years? 16 years where they had tried to get a bill passed for contraceptive equity, right? Which basically says if, a, if an insurance company is covering all these other medications, guess what? You need to cover birth control too, right? Now, she will be the first to tell you she didn't do that alone, but she was there every step of the way. And she's there every step of the way for women's health legislation. So in that sense, sure. Do we want some government uh, assistance and support? Absolutely. In part, we want that support in order to uh, equal the playing field so that low-income women have the same kind of access that middle income and higher income women have. Because otherwise, it really is a class issue. If, I, if, if my choice about pregnancy is really related to my income. So, NARAL, you know, when, when Aaron was listing, you know, the one through four things you can do, I wanna give you a fifth. NARAL Pro-Choice Oregon, and you're gonna hear from Laura for Planned Parenthood. We work in coalition to keep Oregon without any legal restrictions on access. That's what we do. And we need you to do it because elections matter. It was the pro-choice voters in 2006 that defeated a parental notification initiative. It was the pro-choice voters in 2008 that voted for a second U.S. Uh, senator, pro-choice senator, really eliminating an incumbent. And in 2010, believe it, it was the pro-choice voters that secured a pro-choice governor. Because look at what happened across this country. The reason we're here tonight having this conversation is because of the outcome of 2010 elections and the flip of the Republican governors. You would have thought, and I'm going to turn it over to Laura in just a second, but you know, I get going on this. You would have thought that they had campaigned on that, but you know they didn't. They campaigned on small government. They campaigned on remove the regulations. So I listened to, we don't need to regulate the banks. Lord knows we don't need to regulate free market. We don't need to regulate the environment. We don't need to regulate civil liberties or affirmative action or education and discrimination. But by Joe, we do need to regulate a woman's body. Lord, we just can't let them out there all by themselves. <laughs> so, I would so appreciate it if you didn't stop at the table earlier, if you would sign on and sign up. We are also facing two ballot initiatives, and again, I will, I'll let Laura tell you about those, but we work in coalition NARAL, Planned Parenthood, and the ACLU, and together we form the Pro-Choice Coalition of Oregon, and we will keep choice safe in Oregon with your help. <laughs>